determine. Good morning, everybody. Hello and welcome to this plenary on the global imperative how to achieve the SDGs, which are, of course, the sustainable development goals. Yes, I'm just streaming now. So just say, uh, if you could mute, please. Um, we're just starting now, but you should be able to hear me okay. Um, please let me know if you cannot. Um, I'm just talking about the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there are 17 of these adopted by United Nations member states in 2015 uh, as a blueprint for the year 2030. There is, in fact, a great summary of these goals, also known as the Global Goals, on the UN website at sdgs.un.org front slash goals. Uh, it's an interesting time to be talking about sustainable development. Many countries, unsurprisingly, are focused on survival support, um, providing better health services during the pandemic, working on tests and vaccines, and on supporting jobs with direct handouts or tax breaks or money for companies to stay afloat. Um, we're just having a, a technical problem with one of our panelists, which we're... Um, okay. Um, Hello, can you hear us? I can hear you. We're actually underway already. Um, we're just going through some opening remarks about, you know, how this year has basically brought an unprecedented healthcare crisis that has seen more than one million confirmed fatalities from coronavirus and huge strains on public resources. And yet, even in this crisis, there's a need for governments to be thinking about recovery, about what kind of economies and societies come out of this moment, uh, about the longer term challenges around education equality, access to clean water, alleviating poverty. Um, there's also the imperative to think about how this pandemic can lead us to change the way we approach the idea of sustainable cities and communities, about action on climate change. When you think about how the pandemic has shown some people what it's like to breathe cleaner air for the first time in years, and about responsible consumption and production, where our food comes from, where our clothes come from, what is the process of production and shipment and can supply chains become more sustainable? And this crisis has shown us that we can adapt. We can be flexible. We can do things differently. Uh, we've harnessed digital tools in new ways from remote and online learning to working more from home and using our cars, perhaps a bit less, to shopping local and to supporting nearby businesses. There will be enormous challenges ahead because government budgets are under strain. Debt is piling up. There'll be difficult choices ahead around spending and taxes, even as governments perhaps are willing to, to carry those greater debt loads for longer. It'll be hard to keep momentum going on green goals, for example, given the imperative on supporting economic growth and quickly. Poverty, unemployment, homelessness have all risen during this crisis. Children have missed many months of school and those kids who were already behind are simply falling further behind. And the reality is that governments don't always play so nicely together. There are strains on the multilateral system of nations and organisations, with some leaders questioning the validity of everything from the WHO to the United Nations to groupings like the G7 and the G20. There can be a lack of global leadership and collaboration. And some countries are opting to go very much alone, especially when it comes to work on vaccines and sharing vaccines and so on. This crisis risks bringing out the worst in us, but it can also bring out the best in us. Innovative thinking, change and adaptability, a new perspective on our environment, on education. We're getting better all the time at medical innovation, at using digital tools to deliver education and services to more people around the world and cheaply. We have a fresh appreciation for the environment. So I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion today on how we can move beyond the challenges to fresh traction for the Sustainable Development Goals. We'll start with each of our panelists speaking for several minutes, and then I'll turn to a Q&A, where you're welcome to submit questions via the chat button on this platform. I would first like to welcome Camilo Abella from Malta, who is the minister with the office of the Prime Minister. He's a former Foreign Affairs and Trade Promotion Minister and a former Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives. Minister Abella, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, and I thank you for this opportunity to share uh, some thoughts as we mark Sustainable Development Week. Um, 
the initial implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development has commenced on the 1st of January of 2016. Um, a transfor transformative plan of action which is focused to address urgent global challenges over a 15-year period through the identified SDGs. Uh, Ms. Madison, in your introduction, you mentioned a lot of challenges uh, that emerged also during this pandemic, which uh, complicates matters even further. But, of course, uh, we are at a crossroads now um, in the implementation process of these assigned goals and targets, also due to the uh, outbreak of the COVID-19. Um, but I will say what I think about this uh, in a couple of, of minutes. Um, but one of the important issues is governance and policy coherence, uh, irrespective of COVID-19, but this goes also to before uh, COVID-19, when we already in the fifth year of the implementation of the SDGs. So one of the main tools to ensure that the implementation of the SDGs across government is the establishment of dedicated legal instruments to set up the required framework. In Malta, the Sustainable Development Act, which goes back to 2012 actually, sets the governance uh, framework for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Priorities and Principles, which have to be mainstreamed across the workings of government. Apart from structures, another vital instrument is policy coherence, as I, as I mentioned. This is an important tool which integrates the economic, environmental, social and governance dimensions of sustainable development at all stages of policy and of policy making. And this is to ensure the maximization and also the effective mainstreaming of the triple R's of sustainable development. Policy coherence also ensures effective sustainability governance to better incorporate sustainable development into policy and finance, and in that respect, to capitalize on synergies and benefits across economic, social, and environmental policy areas, as well as between domestic and internationally recognized sustainable development goals. Since the adoption of the 2030 Agenda, the Maltese government has been working on aligning our approaches to policy coherence with the principles and nature of the 2030 Agenda and also develop tools and guidance for implementation in collaboration with the European Union, the United Nations specialized organizations and agencies, and also with other stakeholders. An example of this is the sustainable development proofing of the budget process, which has commenced last year. National budgets have an important role in the implementation of the SDGs, rightly so, as you pointed out in your uh, remarks. As these influence government's work programs and what policymakers are able to address when they make policies, when we make policies, it is undeniably important and necessary that, the, that this implementation process has to be supported by the political will from the executive branch of the government to genuinely see the SDGs and their subsequent targets realized. Integrating sustainable development considerations across the, all policy domains of the budget, ranging from the environment and climate to transport, to education, employment, social services and health, as well as finance and economic growth, would support the alignment of initiatives and of incentives and lead to a coherent, informed approach to policy making supported by budgetary decisions. Performance information associated with the budget could also contribute to a more systematic reflection on sustainability, as well as increased transparency and accountability of progress towards social, economic, and environmental goals and other international commitments. While sweeping all 17 SDGs by 2030 is a challenging and daunting task, yet it offers 
countless of opportunities for further investment and innovation, new partnerships and international cooperation, as well as new strategies and policies, leading up to an improved socio-economic development and environmental conservation. Clearly, there is no one size fits all. Since each country has its own constraints, specificities, and economics, and therefore uh, the solution uh, could be different for each and every country. However, as a starting point, we must continue to exploit the inherent interlinkages between the SDGs whilst ensuring a balance between the economic, social, and the environmental dimensions. SDGs are a critical yardstick against which progress will be measured. This requires more coherence, coordination, and also integration across all levels. Our experience with SDG implementation shows that the cross-cutting nature of the SDGs in coordination challenges at every level of the decision-making process, process often leading to divergences arising from the different sectorial interests. It is therefore, it therefore requires us governments to strengthen existing mechanisms and establish clear mandates for vertical coordination between national, local and regional levels. And also horizontal coordination between ministries, entities and departments. Establishing SDG implementation platforms composed of key stakeholders, including civil society and industry representatives, is essential in managing cross-sectorial coordination and overcoming difficulties and increasing accountability. Now, let me try to address a bit the COVID and the SDGs issue. I believe that in the so-called post-COVID era, implementing the SDGs has become even more important. Therefore, there should be no excuses as to what we need to do to save our planet, the environment and humanity as we know it. What was important before COVID will still remain true this time and after. If it's jobs, if it is jobs that we need to create and recreate, then the SDG goal deal with SDG goals deal with that. If it, is, if it is sustainable economic growth that we need, then also the SDGs are part of the solution. At the same time, I also believe that what we want to go through will sensibilize our populations further with regards to the social and the environmental and also the economic aspects of our work on the SDG goals. Therefore, the heightened level of sense of community and also humanity, I would add, that was leveraged to face this pandemic can be replicated in bringing us together to attain our SD goals. I also believe that the witnessing um, and deliberating effect that the detraction of the human factor had on our planet has also left an impact on our subconscious and a stronger respect for our environment and the other living uh, beings. In conclusion, I would like to also add um, that we need to ensure that policies are developed and implemented in an effective and efficient manner. Scientific research and knowledge have a key role to play in helping policymakers to make good decisions. Communicating this knowledge and maintaining close dialogue between researchers and policymakers is essential. We will only be able to reach the SDGs if research is actually used to create better policies and actions. Without such knowledge, there is a risk of wasting human resources and implementing inappropriate uh, action, and thus wasting precious time to the potential detriment of the economy, of the environment, and of society um, by, lar by and large. Involving a wide range of stakeholders will provide us policymakers with a holistic perspective, address potential trade-offs, give voice to, di to diverse interests, 
raise public awareness, and create a sense of ownership. This will give us the strength that we need to turn our aspirations into reality for the benefit of all the individuals, families, and communities across our world. Thank you very much, and I look forward to further engaging with you during this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. If I can turn to Ibrahim Gwimba Saidu, who's from Niger, is the Minister and Special Advisor to the President. I thought we lost you there for a minute, but I'm glad to see you're back. Uh, and I'd invite you to make your opening remarks. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so for us, uh, uh, really, this topic is uh, uh, probably something that we live uh, uh, every day. Uh, sustainable goals has been uh, uh, on our agenda for quite some time. We have used uh, different traditional uh, approaches uh, in addressing them, and we have seen, uh, unfortunately, little results. Uh, what we have decided to do uh, recently in the past few years is really to focus on, 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 on a few fundamentals. Uh, because attaining these development goals, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, an absolutely uh, a priority for the government. Uh, what we have decided to do is to focus mainly on our main resources, which is human capital. Niger is the youngest country on earth, not one of the youngest, but the youngest country. And uh, in, attain, in order for us to attain those development goals, um, we have uh, decided to scale this youth because at the end of the day, it's really it's about service delivery to the community, to the to the to citizens, to the people. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, it really doesn't make any uh, any sense per se. So we have decided then to to focus on those and to leverage uh, technology in order to achieve those. Uh, technology actually for us is seen as a fertilizer. It's a way for us to optimizing the resources that we have. It's a way for us to create a synergy in addressing uh, those goals and in delivering services. So the focus is on the youth technology, and then the third component for us is really access to information and access to knowledge. So that's led the government to set up a plan called Niger 2.0. And what we have done uh, uh, in Geneva by the former director general uh, over two one and a half uh, years ago to discuss that uh, specific uh, agenda of, of ours. We met with the Geneva ecosystem and we uh, since have been working with the SDG labs, which actually even joined the advisory board recently, uh, to show you how dedicated and how focused we are on uh, attending those uh, SDGs. And since uh, we have been piloting a few interesting ideas, uh, and mainly, as I indicated, it's really about service delivery. Uh, it's really not, it's not anything new per se. I mean, it's, uh, uh, in order to attend the goal for us, it's just that you need to now focus on the key areas, making sure that you direct the resources uh, the best way possible. We have developed a blueprint on a smart village approach, which is more or less, let's say, smart community. And, and again, the idea behind that is to pull all the resources we can from the various partners to align them and to making sure that one, we act on the specific needs of the government or on the specific needs of the communities. In Niger, uh, the key challenges for us is really access to uh, good health care, access to education, uh, clean water, and we have a set of five to seven really key SDGs on which we decided to focus and to focus on them by uh, having what we call a carpooling approach. I mean, it's uh, basically what we do in, in, instead of addressing them on isolation, on a standalone basis, we are just focusing on how can we have all those key uh, SDGs actually coexist. How can we have uh, a sort of combo uh, approach in addressing them? We're not going to address the healthcare on a standalone basis, but for us, healthcare is linked to education, it's linked to 
uh, uh, it's linked also to alleviating poverty. It's, it's linked to having access to clean water. Uh, so we have been doing this for quite some time. And uh, as I said, the blueprint has been actually published uh, in June, uh, which actually inviting uh, our viewers and uh, uh, participants actually to, to look up to. It's, uh, it's maybe something that we can post on the, on the site, but otherwise it's on the uh, UN website, especially the ITU. Uh, if you search for a, a smart village, Niger, and then you'll see a very a comprehensive uh, uh, approach actually to attending the uh, SDGs. I'll leave it uh, here and then probably wait for more discussions. And uh, at that time, I'll be able to uh, give more details on, uh, on the approach. So to summarize, uh, is technology uh, uh, applied to um, providing services to the citizens, which are actually the focus of our strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and now I'll turn quickly to Tatiana Valavaya, who's Director General of the United Nations Office at Geneva. She's a former journalist and a diplomat with more than 30 years of experience in government service. Uh, so turning to you now for your remarks. Uh, thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really very pleased to, to be the part of the panel and I'm very happy that Minister Gimba Saido already mentioned SDG Lab that we have here in Geneva and which we are considering as a kind of an entry point for many um, uh, um, interested parties to the Geneva ecosystem. Yes, we uh, adopted SDGs five years ago, but already last year during the 74th General Assembly, uh, we had uh, to admit, and Secretary General was absolutely transparent and very honest in this regard, we had to admit that we are really off the track. And if we went on with implementation uh, of the SDGs as we did over the previous five years, we would not be able to reach SDGs by 2030. That's why the United Nations suggested that we are really have to act very actively and uh, suggested that we would consider this decade the decade of action in order really to reach the SDGs. But that was before the COVID. Then the pandemic came and quite often when you are reading the news, sometimes you see that maybe in certain parts of the world, in certain cases, the momentum is lost. That's understandable because there are very urgent priorities. In, it's a sanitary crisis, it's a social uh, crisis, it's economic crisis. You have to think about urgent measures uh, to uh, um, uh, carry out. Sometimes this urgency uh, is so overwhelming that you are forgetting about the strategy. But for us in the United Nations, the situation with the pandemic is exactly a very good wake-up call. It really shows how relevant, how important SDGs are. And you really can say that today, as a result of this month of pandemic, we can say that we need SDGs more than ever. Because what we have seen during the pandemic, we really saw that those who are vulnerable and who were vulnerable before the pandemic, who were poor due before the pandemic, who suffered before the pandemic, during the pandemic, are more vulnerable, they are poorer, and they are really the first to be touched by the economic, social, or health uh, consequences of the pandemic. Because these are the people who did not receive access even to clean water, which is necessary to fight the pandemic, they were the first to lose their jobs and to suffer lots of very negative consequences. Speaking, for example, about one of the strategic goals, gender parity. We know that women, girls were uh, the, the worst uh, hit by the pandemic in many parts of the world. So we really see that uh, pandemic showed us that uh, SDGs are more relevant than ever, and we really have to make every effort to fight for the uh, SDGs. But uh, uh, 
at the same uh, uh, time, uh, what uh, uh, pandemic showed us that SDGs is not only about reaching uh, certain economic indicators by the year 2030. That's very important. But I think it's much more important to change our mindset, to make sustainable development not something on which we concentrate for the decade which just started. That really should change our mindset and that would lead to another social and economic paradigm where we have less inequality, where we have more justice, where we have development, but this economic development is sustainable, it's not ruining uh, our planet, and really we have, uh, as a result of this uh, decade of action, to change our mindset by the year 2030. The uh, other point I would like to say that, of course, we've been discussing a lot uh, all these years. We need lots of resources, financial resources, in order to reach sustainable development goals. And we, for example, here in Geneva, launch here uh, our SDG Lab together with the financial community of uh, uh, Switzerland, so-called Building Bridges Week, where we try to bring together financial community and developing community and to help building bridges in order to uh, channel financial resources into developing projects. Now, uh, uh, but uh, everybody said, well, it's always very difficult to find, uh, to find these resources. But now we do have absolutely unique opportunity uh, to change uh, the challenge to change the crisis in a really something which has a silver lining. We really see that countries all around the world, national governments, we see international organizations, they are building huge financial and economic uh, packages to fight the recession to uh, fight economic depression, to boost economic development, to create new jobs. We have absolutely unique opportunity which will not repeat itself in the years to come. But we have to use these resources in order, as Secretary General of the United Nations said, in order to build back better. We have to use these resources not just to go back to business as usual, not to give money to support uh, the industries which are not sustainable. We should use this unique opportunity exactly to create new industries, to create new services, to provide education to people in order the, uh, 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 to make it possible for them to find sustainable uh, jobs with a fair uh, pay. It's not easy. We understand when uh, always there is a choice, there are certain solutions which are very easy, very simple, which can easily uh, uh, provide lots of jobs, economic development, but they are not sustainable. Uh, but at the same time, we know there are different solutions. And that's why the last point I would like to uh, make, it's the necessity of solidarity, global solutions, multilateral solutions. And we really have to work together in order to find these solutions. And we, the United Nations, uh, our ecosystem in Geneva was already mentioned, we really think that working together, we can find these solutions. One of the things, for example, which we are trying to do in the SDG Lab is exactly to develop it as a, some kind of a platform where the member states can come and speak about their best practices, about their experiences in reaching the SDGs, sharing their experience and also the lesson le lessons learned. It was absolutely right said there is no uh, scenario fit for all. But we're absolutely sure that our best practices and experiences, which we have, for example, in Latin America, might be of interest for many uh, developing uh, countries in uh, Asia or in Africa or even uh, in Europe. So we have to sh create this pool of experiences, practices, and support each other. So I really think that as uh, as that uh, we need SDGs more than ever, we need this multilateral cooperation, we need multilateral system, we need the United Nations and its uh, organization more than ever. Thank you. Over to you.
Thank you very much. Um, we'll open up now to questions. In fact, I, I'm sorry you've just spoken because I'm going to come straight back to you <laughs> with an initial question, uh, Tatiana, because we've seen some real questions about multilateralism even before the pandemic hit. And you were talking about the opportunity here um, as countries build back better and have massive fiscal packages to use that money in different and creative ways. But how much of a challenge is it right now, given uh, the, the global system? How much is it that faith in that order has has faded? How big a challenge is that? And secondly, a very quick question too. We had one of our listeners asking about uh, do we need more uh, assessment goals along the way? So rather than just assessing ourselves at the end of 2030, do we need more specific assessment points, say in 2022, as we get through the pandemic about where we are with those goals and perhaps a reassessment then? Thank you. Uh, th uh, thank you. Uh, the question about multilaterals is a very important one because uh, we're openly saying that multilateralism was under attack before the pandemic and it's still under attack because we really see that during the pandemic uh, there were quite a number of examples of solidarity, of multilateral cooperation, but also many examples of trying to use national uh, uh, jurisdiction to make the decisions to isolate each other and to uh, look for national solutions. But what we see as a result of the pandemic, it's exactly a clear um, case where we see we can be as healthy, as safe, as prosperous as our neighbors are. There are no national solutions. During the pandemic, we really saw how interconnected the world is. We were speaking about globalization, about the crisis of globalization, but what we really see now as a result of the pandemic, yes, the world is global. It's global from the point of view of our health. There is a problem in one part of the world, and just a few weeks later, half of the humanity is under lockdown. But we also saw how interconnected are we economically, because, well, uh, the usual economic links are disrupted and the crisis is over. We saw before the pandemic, we were saying, well, maybe we need less uh, tourism, less travel, because that's uh, uh, not good from the point of view of uh, ecology. Some countries were complaining too many tourists are coming, but now no tourists are coming and we see very difficult economic situation. So when building back, for example, tourist industry, we really have to build back sustainable tourist uh, industry, which will give profit to the country, which is welcoming tourists, but it will not be ruining uh, uh, the environment. We also, before the pandemic, were speaking about uh, digital uh, our world, about risks of digital divide. Now, during the pandemic, we are really seeing that, well, we are already living in digital world. We have this conference, for example, we've been communicating over this week, but we have to understand that half of the humanity, 46 a percent of our citizens, they do not have access to the internet. That means their opportunities to receive uh, education, to be connected uh, with other um, uh, communities, uh, to find the work over internet or even to do the shopping are limited. So that's exactly uh, why uh, we see uh, as a result of the pandemic how global challenges are. And if these are challenges are global, we really are obliged to find multilateral solutions. I'm absolutely sure that as a result of the pandemic, there will be cases uh, all around the world of countries and local communities thinking that we can better survive alone. And for the time being, for several weeks or maybe months, that's the case. But I'm absolutely sure that the understanding of a necessity of global a cooperation, multilateral cooperation, and much better modern multilateral uh, system will come as one of the results, consequences of the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn to Mr. Abella. I think that Mr. Grimbasada, you'll have a view on this as well, because it's a real juggling act for governments who have to get their economies moving again and make choices about how do you facilitate growth quickly without compromising other things. And with all that stimulus that's got on, how can budgets still take account 
of the sustainable development goals? How can they still prioritize those? And I'm thinking one particular thing there, and that's green goals. How can you ensure that your environmental goals keep moving in alignment with sort of budgetary necessity when it comes to the, to the economy? And can, in fact, can you do affordable green goals at this point? in time. So where does this leave sustainability when it comes to the environment? Uh, first to Mr. Abella, but I think Mr. Uh, Gwimbasaja, you'll have some points on this as well. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, actually, I made reference uh, in, my, in my opening remarks on this. Uh, so uh, when it comes to policy coherence, it has to be reflected also in the national, bu in the national budget. So aligning uh, the budget, the national budget, um, together with policies that are in the direction that you mentioned on uh, sustainability, for example, and you mentioned examples of environmental goals and policies, uh, this has to be reflected in the national budget. So the importance of aligning the national budget when it comes to the proposals that governments uh, put forward for the uh, next year, uh, it's important that this uh, policy coherence is there and that the national budgets are also aligned with these priorities that go also hand in hand with implementing the SDGs. Uh, I think a fundamental issue is that we need to look at uh, the implementation of SDGs not as a cost but as an opportunity because if we look at the SDGs that we have to fork out money rather than uh, that we have an opportunity here that by implementing all SDGs, and some of the SDGs go in the direction of creating more wealth, of creating um, a greater economy, uh, of course in a sustainable way, in a green way, um, having uh, digitalization more at the heart of our new economy, so to speak, um, which makes it also greener, uh, but also it gives us also more resilience in times when we are faced with uh, a pandemic such as this, for example. So I think that policy coherence together with the uh, alignment of budget, but also conceptually looking at SDGs not as a cost, but as an opportunity to move forward, also to solve certain issues that were created by the pandemic itself, I think it's the best way to, to move forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gwabai Saidu, do you have any viewpoint on that? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. I mean, there are a few points that I would like to, to, to add. Uh, uh, actually, the, the president was even uh, uh, attending uh, a U.S. Uh, uh, a UN story, uh, conference on uh, climate uh, last week. He reemphasized the fact that Niger that uh, remains a priority. Um, uh, in the case of the news, uh, we have been hit by serious flooding uh, the past uh, the past several weeks. But that's the contrast for us. Uh, on one hand, we're a very desert country uh, with all the challenges uh, that we see in the Sahel region, and uh, uh, yet were hit by serious flooding, uh, and, and which actually just reinforced the fact that uh, this is uh, a, a key issue for us. So there is a cluster that has been set up uh, at the government level with the minister in charge of uh, environmental issues, as well as of agriculture, and uh, the other who are working now in to ensure that there is uh, I mean, uh, remains and that the resources are actually uh, continue to be directed towards that. As I said, flooding, unfortunately, is, uh, is, is making that an, an even dire situation. So uh, environment remains key. Uh, the resources, there is a, a, a budget, uh, an emergency fund of about 130 billion CESA, which is uh, roughly uh, close to $200 million that have been actually uh, uh, announced uh, about two or three weeks ago. Um, so yes, uh, this is uh, uh, still a key, uh, a key and uh, focus area for us, and uh, uh, it's something that we have to, to deal with in addition to COVID and other challenges. Uh, what I would like to say for, for a country like Niger, 
and uh, many other countries in the Sahel region. This is not new per se, really. SDGs are not new. So it's, it's, it's really something that we, we have been living with for the past several uh, uh, decades or so. Uh, what uh, uh, we, we're just trying to do now is to optimize our approach to see what is the best way of uh, uh, reaching good results. And I indicated it earlier, one way of looking at it for us is by looking at creating synergy. That's what we are uh, uh, really experimenting. That's what we're piloting. That's where also we're seeing uh, really tangible resources, uh, results, sorry. Uh, we are, uh, again, environment is not something that needs to be looked at on a standalone basis. How can we combine that again with uh, uh, even uh, the SDG uh, goal number one? Because if you want to attain I mean, no poverty, you need to make sure that you take care of all those environmental issues. So it's uh, a climate on one hand, but it's also how uh, could... Uh, that citizens actually take care of their own uh, immediate environment. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, but uh, as I say, it's not new for us. It's a, it's a focus, and the, the recent event actually are again making it maybe an even bigger priority than it was before. Thank you. If I can just follow up with uh, you again directly, um, and we've, we've got three and a half minutes left, and I want to do a quick lightning round with each of you on this question. So you've all got about 30 seconds to answer, 45 seconds, but I'll start with you. Um, you talked about synergy, and I'm very interested in the role of digi digital tools and all of this, which each of you have mentioned uh, in, you, in your presentations today, because it feels like, um, Tatiana, as you were saying, this crisis has shown us um, the wonderful use of technology uh, in the best sense. Um, technology can get a bad rap, but in fact, it can help facilitate a lot of things. Has this shown us that we can use technology in new and different ways across a range of challenges with the, with the goals, be it healthcare, be it for young women to have access to services, um, even for sustainable cities? Like, How do you see this changing things in terms of the application of digital tools with these goals? And you each have about 45 seconds. Oh, but I'll start with you, Mr. Gumbel. Uh, well, digital tools are crucial. And uh, as I said, there are lots of opportunities for uh, education, uh, uh, for access absolute. to health uh, 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 Telemedicine uh, is... Uh, but... There is some technical problem. But the question is, as I mentioned, we do have inequality in the access to the Internet, to digital technology. And we really can increase the inequality existing already in the world if we do not concentrate on eradicating this digital divide. Because we are really moving to this digital era. It's important to support the countries all the countries around the, uh, the world which are needing this support in order to eradicate this divide. Because without the access of digital technology, young people will not have a opportunity to receive proper education, to improve their skills, to find their job. So for me, uh, uh, one of the most important things is exactly to concentrate on uh, eradicating this digital divide. Thank you. Um, and now I'll turn to Mr. Agumba Saidu, if you can hear me um, quickly on the digital question. For us, I mean, definitely. And uh, uh, I, the analogy maybe that I'll make is that uh, for us, the digital is more or less like the blood in the human uh, system. So through the use of ICT, we're able actually to really create a synergy, you know, that the blood carries information and make sure that all the vital organs actually function properly. So that's how we, we really look at uh, 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 digital. And it has been helping a great time during this uh, very difficult uh, 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 moment that we're all living. That's what is helping us actually connecting with the rest of the world, the Niger, with the little resources that we have. Without that, will be completely uh, forgotten. That's also what has helped us focus on the youth, you know, to create and innovate and create solutions so that we can address uh, the key element. Education, you mentioned it. How can we make sure that kids continue to go to school? Uh, healthcare, how can we make sure that 
we have a more uh, optimized uh, a solution. One example, just to give you an idea, Niger has less than 2,000 doctors for a population of about 22 million inhabitants. So you see the picture. What we have been doing now is to leverage technology to do teleconsultation and, 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 and things like that. So that creates an opportunity to have doctors everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're pretty much out of time, but I would like to ask Minister Abella if you have any quick closing remarks about the role of digital tools in all of this. Thank you. Yes, I will be, I will be very, very quick. Um, also, in agreeing with um, previous speakers um, about the importance of uh, digital tools and digital means. Actually, from experience, we, during uh, the some restrictions that we had in the last months, uh, we communicated via digital means, irrespective whether it's for health reasons, for education reasons, for work purposes. So basically, technology is of utmost importance, also in creating new jobs, even in, in, in how our economies will, 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 will be in the future. And the future is also through technology, through uh, digitalization. Um, so this gives us also an opportunity of creating more jobs, but then we have to be even more attentive to avoid the digital divide and uh, also the lack of access due to different uh, reasons and different circumstances. So basically, uh, we have an opportunity, but we need also to be careful how this opportunity we implement it. Otherwise, the divide will continue to become bigger rather than uh, have uh, this divide getting even uh, narrowing this divide. So yes, we have an opportunity, but it's up to us how to better implement it for the benefit of all. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I would like to start to say a very quick thank you to all the panelists today. I found it a very interesting discussion myself. I'm grateful for your time and for your wisdom, um, and I'm sure our, our listeners have as well. So thank you very much, and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.